So hi, everybody, and um, welcome to week three of uh, the Women in Technology and Science Leadership Series, uh, helping celebrate WITS's 30th anniversary. Uh, I'm Gavin Fox, founder of Dublin Tech Talks. Uh, we're a leading meetup and podcast series in association with Icon Accounting, and we are delighted to be associated with this leadership series, uh, which this week is focused on engineering and, and developing leaders within this field. Uh, today's speakers, we have Aoife Hearn, who is College Principal for the College of Engineering and Architecture uh, and Dean of Engineering UCD. She has particular research interests in transport engineering and education. Uh, we have Peter Hendrick, who is CEO of um, the National Broadband Ireland, uh, who successfully led the competitive bid for the National Broadband Plan um, as the Managing Bid Director. Uh, we have Marguerite um, McCarthy, who is Head of Education and Public Engagement at Science Foundation Ireland. And finally, we have Margaret uh, Sayers, who is the Executive Director of Customer Solutions at US, uh, ESB. Uh, and was President of Engineers Ireland uh, for 2019 and 2020. Today's panel will be moderated by uh, Jennifer Keenan, who is Assistant Professor and School Head of Teaching and Learning in Civil Engineering at UCD. We hope you enjoy it. It's a great panel. Uh, over to you, Jennifer. Hi, so uh, welcome everyone. It's, it's great to see you here today. Um, as Gavin mentioned, um, uh, like many organisations, we were unable to mark um, the occasion of our 30th anniversary uh, here at WITS, uh, given the, the global pandemic. Um, and so now we're delighted to host this series of panel discussions um, in the area of leadership in, in STEM. Uh, and, and with today, the particular focus is on engineering. Um, so all of our panelists here today are, are engineers uh, and, and like myself, uh, I, I did engineering in, in UCD some time ago. Um, and, and one of the key things um, about engineering, even still, is that there's, there's often um, uh, quite a difference in, in the number of ladies, ladies and men uh, who, who study engineering and then who go on to practice. So I suppose maybe if, if, we, if we kick off on, on, that, uh, on that theme, uh, maybe P Peter, to you first, um, uh, what, what was your experience of, of uh, st studying engineering and, and what, were there many more um, men compared, to, compared with ladies? Good afternoon. Um, I suppose when, when I look back um, early 90s in, in Kevin Street in Dublin, um, I, to be honest with you, I didn't know what I wanted to do other than I wanted to do something in engineering and it, it came down to the CAO and, and what scoring you got. And I landed into electrical engineering. And at first, I wanted um, structural engineering, but I went to electrical. And um, when we went, when we started out, there was 140 students in the class, and I think it was seven or eight uh, women uh, in the class, which was which was um, both um, interesting and and, and probably um, um, mind-boggling, given that I'd come from a mixed um, primary school and obviously a boys' secondary school. But the fact that there were so few women in engineering was was um, I suppose understandable at the time because even even as a as a seventeen year old starting in college, I had no idea what engineering really meant. Other than that, I thought it was going to be using my hands and doing something practical. And um, so I probably understood at the time. But that's why you know you know for men it's different going in and using your hands. I think it's physical. But once you get into engineering and the maths and the physics behind it and the interest behind it, you start to realise there's so many different opportunities in engineering. Um, so it's such a broad industry. You can end up, I mean, I started out in electrical engineering on the industrial and power side of engineering. And I actually, by the time I was finished college, I was, I was in automation. I was programming what, what would have been, what you classify today as robots um, in terms of on production lines. And then I got into communications and then that broadened in terms of moved into sales and then into management and then obviously running on the bid and starting our own business and um, started our own business. And then and then ended up in terms of the bid director and CEO of National Broadband Ireland. So now I look back and I say, actually, it's so different to what I thought it was going to be that, that the first thing we have to do is, is communicate at, at secondary school level. What exactly does engineering mean today? And, and probably, you know, different to where I was in the early 90s, the view is probably autonomous cars are putting people on the moon or, you know, there's, there's no limit now to what engineering is. Engineering isn't about... You know, physically putting your hands to work, and um, you know it's about it's about software development. It's about you know driving technology. It's about innovation. It's you know there's no limit, and I and I think I think that's the message we have to start drilling into um, um, students in second in secondary schools, as engineering can brought can be much broader than you know that industrial 
view that I would have had in the early 90s. And I do look, look, I, I was a, I was a, an external examiner in Kevin Street then in, in the, um, in the noughties into the early uh, 2011, 2012. And you could start to see some, you know, the, the, the mix increased, a lot more female coming into, into engineering, but still way down even at that stage uh, compared to where I think it, where I think we can go today when you start thinking about the role that women play in, in particularly engineering companies today. And um, I think it's, I think it, we're, we're moving to a place where well, we have to change the narrative in terms of what is engineering all about or STEM technologies all about. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. And, and maybe, um, Marguerite, if I, if I come to you next, um, based on, on your experience of, of, of engineering and, and now in practice and, and in ESB, um, how, how do you find um, the challenges at the moment in, in supporting uh, gender balance? Um, and actually, I, I should mention, I, I was asked at the very beginning and I clean forgot, if anybody has questions that they'd like to pose for our panellists, uh, pl please do pop them in chat uh, and, and we'll collate those and come to them later on in the session. Uh, so, so any questions at all, pop, pop them in chat. Um, so, so Marguerite, over to you. Yeah, so first of all, just congratulations to WITS on the 30 years. It's a fantastic uh, anniversary and it has actually just struck me that uh, we have a parallel because um, it's 30 years ago since I graduated in engineering this year as well. And since that time I've been in ESB. So I have to say I've had an absolutely fabulous uh, career. I never felt for one minute within ESB, except for the work that I've been doing, uh, I suppose at different times on diversity. I never ever felt that there was any um, distinguishing factor. Nobody drew a parallel. And I worked with, with frontline teams with network technicians, which were effectively all male. Um, never, never had uh, that, that issue come up at all. So I suppose the important thing at, at that stage, um, I suppose when I, when I did engineering, it was electrical for me uh, as well as Peter. Um, it was a, quite an unusual year even then because there were 20% of us of our class were female. Um, there was 55 in the class and there was 11 females. Actually, um, Margie's sister was in my class by coincidence. Um, but uh, in the civil engineering class in UCC at the time, there were 70 males and one female. So that was extremely unbalanced. And even still from, from Engineers Ireland, we know that you know about 13% of graduates are female. So we still have a huge amount of work to do in order to try and encourage females into the career. I think what Peter said is absolutely key. I think there's so much confusion about what engineering is that it's really important for all of us to get out there and to explain what our jobs are because otherwise the, the term is a little bit abused as well. You know, you have everything from the, the drain engineer to the dishwasher engineer, et cetera. And, and that leaves parents confused as well. So a huge amount of, of work necessary to explain what engineering is and to talk about our roles and again, show that, you know, there are really good uh, careers for women in engineering and that, you know, you don't have to be, um, you know, uh, present company notwithstanding an entire uh, weird uh, oddball in order to choose engineering, that it's actually quite a normal thing to do. And um, there are other countries um, where there's a much higher proportion of females doing engineering. For example, I think in Latvia, it's about 30%. In Iceland, it's very high as well. So it is possible actually to get more uh, females into engineering. We just have to normalize it uh, a bit. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of what we do in ESB is about going out to schools and actually bringing people who are interested into the company for a week, both uh, for engineering apprenticeships, which is um, uh, or uh, technician apprenticeships, which is a very non-traditional area, even more so than, than graduate engineers and also for graduate engineers. And I just saw Magella Henschen's name come up there just to give Magella a shout out. She does huge work for ESB on that front. Uh, she's in the audience today. So um, it's really important to do that outreach. Super. Th 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 thanks, Marguerite. And, and you mentioned such a valuable point about um, raising the profile of, of engineering and, and what it is. And, and when I think back to my own experience, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what I had in my CAO. Um, and after the exams and after the change of mind window, um, my mom sat me down and she says, Jennifer, you need to change your CAO. You, you need to put down engineering. And, and then I waddle off in to look up the dictionary. What is engineering? What, what, what am I, you know, so, so I am guilty. I am one of those people who, who really didn't know what engineering was. And, and yet it has been uh, the, the most fantastic career for me to date. Um, uh, and there's an interesting synergy here to our panels. So we've we Peter and Marguerite on 
on, on the electrical engineering side, uh, very much in, in, uh, in the private sector. And, and then on, on the civil engineering side, we've, we've Eva and Margie, um, and, and they're very much um, uh, also in, in the academic uh, side of things. So maybe if, if, I, if I come to you first, um, what, what, what do you notice to be the challenges and the benefits um, uh, ongoing at the moment in, in this area? Okay, well, I was just reflecting on what some of the others have said about their own experiences of very small numbers. And um, I think that changed. One of the greatest challenges was, was trying to get more women to come into engineering. And while acknowledging that Marguerite's saying we have very few numbers still graduating, you know, that you're, I think it was 10%, she said, I think that is beginning to change. I think that's a challenge that's still there, but it's beginning to change slowly. And if I look at our intake in the, the first year in engineering in UCD over the last couple of years, we've hit the, the 30, just over 30% of our first years are female engineers. So um, an enormous benefit has been that opportunity to get out and talk to girls in secondary school, but also talk to boys as well, because while you're all saying that there, there, there's a lack of understanding of what engineering is, I don't think that's just for women. I think that's for male students as well. But there's been a tendency for it to be more natural, even if as a boy you didn't understand what engineering was, to still drift towards that career. I see with engineering um, a major thing that has happened over the last few years is that engineering has become more difficult to get into. The points have got higher. It's seen as a more prestigious course to get into now. And an unexpected benefit of that has been that female students are more likely to look at it, especially high achieving female students, because in the past, high achieving female students drifted towards medicine and wouldn't have considered engineering as a career. But now they see it as a real and viable alternative. Now, that's not why the points have gone up, but it is an unexpected benefit of what has happened there. Other things that have happened, which are the real benefits in the area as well, is the the range of disciplines in engineering has expanded so much as well. I'm not trying to stereotype, but we do see more um, female engineering students being attracted in by the biomedical area. And by that kind of a difference, that engineering isn't all hard hat and steel cap boost, though there are girls in that area. And we hope that some females do come into those areas. But the broader range of disciplines that, in engineering, that is in engineering there today is a huge benefit to us. I think a major challenge going forward, though, is while we're getting that intake of girls coming in, we're not seeing them all the time staying in the career. So there are changes that need to happen at the industry level to make it more likely that females will stay in. We know in Ireland that um, compared to other professions, females abandon engineering at a much greater rate than they do law, medicine, other areas. So what's happening in the industry that's making it less easy for women to stay in these careers than in other equally demanding high profile kind of careers? Um, and I think that's also the same in academia as well, not just at an industry, I would say my own area as well. We haven't been great at seeing women through from undergraduate to postgraduate to PhD to staying on in, in an academic career. So for me, that's the big challenge of not just getting them into engineering, but getting them to stay in engineering once they're there. That's that's such a, a, an important point, and and it kind of builds on to to uh, to, to the next topic that I that I was going to um, to bring up, which is you know get getting um, getting ladies into engineering is is one thing, but keeping them and retaining uh, females um, is 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 another thing altogether. And and I know Margie, you you've had a really um, fantastic career from from what I followed to date. Um, could you maybe sh share a little bit? Uh, with us about about your path and and maybe um, what your experience has been uh, in this space. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, and actually, yeah, very much on on what Aoife was saying. Um, I think there are structural changes that need to be implemented, actions to address to retaining people. But one of the real benefits of an engineering qualification is. How transferable it is, and it, and how much of a, a toolkit it is in terms of it can it can bring you to any walk of life. Um, and I, I suppose I think I said to you before, Jennifer, that um, when I was sitting doing the leaving search, I certainly wouldn't have predicted. I think a couple of people have said it so far. I would not have predicted that I'd be where I am today. Uh, I mean, I I started out in a family where women did engineering in our family, uh, and it was okay to be into engineering and to be into ballet because my mum was a, a ballerina, a ballet dancer at the time. So there, there were no kind of, you must go into this pigeonhole and you must do this. Uh, it was, you could be involved in, in a whole range. 
and qualified in engineering and worked in consulting engineering for um, you know almost 10 years in in the kind of environmental and structural side and I suppose got very involved in public consultation and and for those of us who've been involved in public consultation on infrastructural projects and I'm sure I can see lots of heads nodding there on tree cutting etc um normally the people who turn up to those types of consultations are people who either love your design or absolutely hate it you get very little in the middle um and it really did I suppose make me think about the training you get as an engineer the technical training and how you don't really train on the people aspect which is kind of unusual when you're a civil engineer because it's kind of in the title <laughs> um, so uh, that really got me interested in in how do we communicate engineering and how do we listen to what people are telling us they need from the solutions that we're trying to design? Because that's what engineers do. We, we design solutions for, for people. And um, I, I went through uh, a few years in Engineers Ireland. I joined, I uh, was saying Marguerite the other day, I, I joined really to head up the STEPS program, their schools program, to kind of get that under my belt. I was going back to consulting engineering, um, but ended up staying 10 years working in the regulatory side um, and as as the, as the membership director and since then um, left to join Science Foundation Ireland which is the funding agency for research in, in STEM areas uh, but I head up the public engagement side so trying to uh, enhance and advance kind of public dialogue and uh, on the innovations that we're trying to drive towards for society so uh, and also inspire young people so exactly the barriers that you're talking about I suppose one last thing I mentioned is I chair, because I know there's a couple of members of the group here, um, chair the Department of Education's uh, group looking at gender balance in early years to post-primary education. And um, we're working through recommendations for the to, for systemic change, I suppose, and action in terms to address those early years. That's fantastic. It's, it's such wonderful um, experience and such a wonderful career uh, to date. Um, and I suppose you, you mentioned such an important um, uh, part of, of engineering, which is Engineers Ireland and, and, um, and that professional body that we have. Um, and, and I suppose, Marguerite, if I come back over to you, because I know you've had some fantastic um, experience where, uh, where, where you were president um, uh, of, of Engineers Ireland. Um, uh, what kind of things, um, through your experience with Engineers Ireland, but also, I suppose, in ESB, um, what kind of things um, are happening now to, to support uh, better gender balance um, in, in retaining women and, and promoting women? Yeah, so I suppose this was always a very personal topic for me because, like everybody else said, I didn't know what engineering was either. And actually, at that time, even though I have a lot of cousins now who've become engineers, I had no history at all of engineering in my family. So it, it didn't dawn on me. I was, I was scratching around trying to figure out what to do. And the reason that I chose engineering was because I went to an information evening in 1990 or 1989, sometime like that, that was run by Engineers Ireland. And they came to the town and they spoke to students that were studying maths and physics. And it really resonated with me. So I kind of felt that I had come full circle um, last year, um, having the opportunity and, and the privilege of being president. Um, to be in, in that position to actually, uh, I suppose, be out and, and uh, speaking about engineering and uh, I suppose in that context, being a female role model um, at that level. But it's a fantastic organization, hugely built on volunteers. So all over the country, all the time, there's 26,000 members, but so many of those people get involved in volunteering to go into schools on a regular basis, both primary and post-primary through the STEPS program that Margie mentioned earlier on. Uh, and they talk to students about what an engineer is and really emphasize, you know, what engineers have done in Ireland, what the jobs are like, but also that role about providing solutions and being inventors. Um, I, I was really, I suppose, put on, on um, my heels at one of those. Um, I was talking to uh, primary school kids and, and one kid put his hand up and he said, what have you invented? Um, which is a very difficult uh, question to answer. I, I'm sure the other people on the panel will will uh, will understand. But um, uh, what that those programs going to schools are really important. And, and there's others like Young Engineer of the Year, um, where you know, you've know you got third and fourth class um, students now that are doing an actual engineering project. Uh, in my own company, we have things like Science Blast now for primary school, which is kind of like a, a junior version of, um, you know, the, 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 um, the science, what's it called? The Young Scientist. Young scientist, yeah. So, so all of that encourages kids to get involved. And it's amazing really with primary school kids, 
they're so excited when they when they've got their projects to explain to you what they've done and the questions that they're trying to answer. So um, going out to schools, hugely important, that promotion and all that volunteer work as well that's done. I think just being present and, and being available and, and making the career more normal and accessible to both boys and girls is really important. Um, but there does seem to be just more work to be done with girls because on an OECD survey, the top career that was chosen by boys that they were likely to pursue was engineering and it was nowhere in the top 15 with girls and that's internationally so we said we definitely still have work to do that's that's very interesting um uh, and and such fantastic work being being done at engineers ireland it's it's, it's really wonderful um w- one of the things that's so topical at the moment um is is COVID and and all of the adaptions we've all had to make um, I suppose, Peter, if I was to come over to you next, um, uh, how would you see um, uh, COVID has changed the landscape? I suppose in many cases it has been um, a big hindrance, uh, but, but in other cases, I guess barriers have been um, taken down in, in terms of uh, greater flexibility in, in how we work. Um, what, what's your take on, on all of that? Um, I think if we look at the opposite, the opposite side of what lock, what is lockdown meant um, for many of us, it's it's really um, the dependence on the dependence on technology and, and access to applications and, and, and tools that we probably wouldn't have used in the past. So, you know, we, we've been talking about it for twenty years in the telecoms industry about bringing um, voice and video together. You know, doing away with the landline um, and, and everybody using video applications I mean, as a, as an industry. We've been trying to sell this for 20 years and it only took a, a global pandemic to get everybody to go on to using video. Um, but as a result of that, I think it's broken down the barriers from, from, a, from an employ, employer's perspective. And um, everybody's now focused on um, remote working. And something that we're obviously supporting is Grow Remote and supporting that we have post, post the pandemic, we would have up to 30% of our, our employees all working remote. And I think that, that has fed into, okay, how, do we, how does that support um, bringing women into uh, technology and engineering? It really is that it's a flexibility around the way we work today. And we, we see it now, even when you think about um, the impact of level five lockdown, creches closed, and creches are only, only available to frontline workers. And, um, you know, we have teams where, um, you know, both parents are working and we've had to be, we've had to schedule or, or adapt um, their working hours on both sides, obviously, um, around uh, young kids, toddlers and so on, where they have to mind the kids at home. And it's about output. And I think a lot of employers are now focused on the output as opposed to clocking in at nine and finishing at five. And I think that's changed um, the view, and particularly for women coming back to work. Um, it, it, you know, There's no job they can't go out. There's no career path they can't chase down. So I, I think that's taken away a barrier. But then equally, I suppose, if I think about innovation and startups and the opportunity to... Not, not only sell locally, but also sell internationally. And, um, you know, the fact that we're using or, or we're seeing, you know, high-speed broadband and NBI under the National Broadband Plan is a big part of rolling of high-speed broadband across Ireland. It's taking down all the barriers associated with a global a global audience or a global mar- marketplace. So no matter what ideas or innovation you have, doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter if you live in Ackle Island or Valencia Island, Island or you live in Dublin or you live in London, those barriers are gone forever. Um, and, and I've seen it with a lot of regional companies that have set up and they're encouraging people now to come back. You know, if I look at um, the northwest of, of Ireland, there's over 300,000 graduates that, that over, over, the, over the past 10, 15 years who've gone off to different places um, across the world. Now there's an opportunity to go back, get the work-life balance. And it really is about getting that work-life balance right. Um, it's difficult in our business. We're starting up. We only started up a year ago with over 200 people employed and over a thousand people working on the ground. And it's difficult when you're trying to do something at, at, at speed, but we've committed to the grow remote. And also, I suppose it's interesting when I look at this week and we, and we as an SMT, senior management team, we looked at, okay, how do we, how do we support um, Women's International Day? And what can we do? What are them bringing connectivity and not, um, providing the foundation for all of those uh, platforms and opportunities? And we thought about the schools going back into the secondary schools. We're going to connect over the next two years, uh, over 670 sec- secondary schools across the country with high-speed broadband. And it's using our platform, the infrastructure, and educating um, the students, both boys and girls, about 
and what the opportunities are, you know, in this STEM area, you know, science, technology, and that it's not just about what, what, what that, you know, what have you invented? And I suppose in, in inventing something sounds very, very interesting. But, but even when I think going back to college and coming through college, there was no career guidance in terms of when you're going through college. It was you applied for whatever jobs you went for and you landed where you landed and you created your own journey. And I think what's clear is you can do engineering and go into sales. You know, you don't have to do a business degree. You can do engineering, go into management or go into accounts. You know, there, there is a progression, but the foundation of engineering and technology is, is, um, is a great start in any career, in any industry. And I think the one thing I, one thing I, I take away 20 years later is engineering and technology is in every single business, every single business, no business that doesn't use technology. And it, and it can be a telephone or, or the internet or, or all the way through to and software applications. I think it's clear, you know, there's a role in every business for somebody with an engineering uh, qualification. I, I would totally agree. Um... I, I think there aren't enough engineers in the world, but yeah. there should be more of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, you make some fantastic points um, ab about initiatives to to support uh, female engineers and, and in retaining them um, and 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 uh, supporting them. And I suppose um, when when I think to to the other side of, of things in, in the academic world, and, and maybe Eva, if I was is to come to you next. Um, I know there's a big initiative in, in the space of the, of the Athena Swan Award and, and there's a lot of work ongoing um, in, in higher mm -hmm. education at, at the moment in, in, in promoting uh, gender balance and gender equality in, in, in all forms. Um, can, can you share, us, uh, share with us a little bit about, about that and, and the fact that the, the College of Engineering in UCD has been sure. successful? Um, so, so just for those of you not uh, familiar with the, what Athena Swan is, Athena Swan is an award given to academic institutions and um, looking at, it's not saying that everything is okay in your institution, it's saying that you have considered the issues around gender mostly, though Athena Swan is extending out to look at BAME as well um, later uh, in its current format, but at the moment it looks at gender and it asks you as an institution to look at what is happening in, in your area around gender, um, what are the work arrangements that you might have in place that don't support women? All of those kind of factors. Um, and when you and, and your students as well. And then to describe how you're going to meet those challenges. What are you going to do to improve things in the future? And how are you going to fix things that aren't right? And how are you going to continue on the practices that are working well in your sector? So the College of Engineering and Architecture two years ago achieved um, a bronze Athena Swan Award and we were the first engineering college in the, in, in the country to achieve that and it was all the schools, so civil, electronic, across the, the board, all our engineering schools achieved that. Um, but it's very important, as I said at the start, to, to remember that that means... Um, it seems like we might have some, some small connectivity issues there. Um, uh, I, I am trusting that everybody can can still see and, and hear me okay. So maybe at this point we'll we'll take a pause and, and move over to to, to Margie. Um, I know that uh, uh, there's been um, a lot of work being done in on the policy side of things to to you know where SFI are, are the funding institution and and yeah. you're really looking to to the universities, to the, the education institutes, to really, uh, to emphasize gender equality and gender balance. And, and am, I, am I correct in understanding that, um, that this Athena Swan is becoming uh, an ever more important um, a thing for universities to have? Maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, obviously Science Foundation Ireland is, is, as you said, a funding agency. So it has a certain role in, in terms of, of how it stimulates, I suppose, and supports and enables better gender balance and diversity within the academic system. Um, I suppose in terms of our work, I spoke to you about the kind of earlier pipeline piece that we do around schools and et cetera, but we did release a gender strategy for SFI back in 2016 and, and set about some key elements um, that will be brought in actions wise to address better 
um, gender balance in the award holders. So if you imagine we have obviously a portfolio of many awardees who are in receipt of funding from SFI and we wanted to increase the percentage that were female to 30% and we're, we're pretty much at that uh, at this stage. Um, the Athena Swan is one key part of that where by 2019 we were not going to accept I suppose applications for funding from higher institu education institutions that hadn't achieved at least the bronze level. So um, that obviously became a, a key feature for research leading um, or research performing organisations um, because SFI would be and, and the IRC and the HRB also so other key funders in the, in the academic state space also looked for this. So Athena Swan was a good trigger for that and um, before I talk a bit more about SFI that's I suppose something that we're trying to look at as well for the early years to post-primary is how do you build a framework like Athena Swan that was introduced into third level to address the language and the barriers and the timetabling and all those kind of unconscious bias elements that play its part in influencing your choices as a young person. Um, but then from an SFI perspective, we introduced a number of other measures um, across different programs. For example, the kind of starter investigator program, the, the real kind of uh, early career, I suppose, um, lead applications. Uh, we, we looked for a balance from the higher education institutions between uh, equal number of male, female applicants coming in so that there needed to be a balance. And, and that saw a 20% plus um, increase in the female awardees that, that came out of the programme. Um, most recently, one of our largest programmes, the Frontiers for the Future programme, what we did is we worked with gender experts to look at the language with, that was in the call document, for instance. Um, I mean, th th they're kind of simple things like even recruitment internally within SFI, what we found is the public engagement side predominantly women applied for but if you were looking for a scientific program manager in the kind of physics or the physical sciences area men were applying so we wanted to look at well is there something in the recruitment piece that we're writing that's just appealing <laughs> to to a particular gender and it was funny because there was there were things that you just don't pick up on because usually it's the hiring manager for instance who will write that spec right and so you, your natural inclination is to write what you know in terms of you, you this is what I'm looking for skills set um so we did the same with some call documents and we've seen increases uh, in percentage of female award holders through that plus other measures where for example if scores were equal on all other counts then the female candidate would be awarded the funding as an act of rebalancing the fact that the female participation was so low and all of these things maternity leave and maternity cover as well these are all actions that all par play a part within the kind of greater higher education sphere to make a difference we've more to do of course we have a new strategy and development at the moment but they're just some of the actions that we've put in play it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic to hear that. I, I see that we've got Aoife back. Um, we'll, we'll, have, about that. <laughs> we'll have to get on to Peter and his national broadband rollout and see if we can get you, get you some fiber. Um, <laughs> we, we might come back to you, Aoife, just briefly. Um, okay. I know no, I'm not quite sure where I got cut off there, but um, yeah, I was talking about the Athena Swan and what we're doing. So it ties in a lot with what Marjorie was saying in terms of looking at our work practices, et cetera, and, um, and how we can support faculty better. And one part of that is, for example, in recruitment, we've also looked at are we using gendered language in our in our recruitment because more often than not, we put out an advert for a lectureship in, in academia and um, you could get no female applicants. You could have 60 applicants and not one of them female. And we have had issues around about the types of language that we're sometimes using in that, that you must be outstanding, you know, um, exceptional in everything that you do. And, and our male candidates go, well, I'm nearly there, so I'll pop my name in. But <laughs> our female candidates are not as likely to do so if they don't achieve everything. But I think the Athena Swan gives, is very good because it gives you a framework to understand what you need to improve or what you need to change to make things better and as I was I think it was just when I was being cut off I was saying if, if you improve the flexibility or you improve the work practices for female um, staff that does improve them for male staff as well because I think the other side of this equation is what is happening in your home life and those balancing of the work and home life balance and that's not something that's just about women you know or, or at least it shouldn't be just about women at least and um, the children are, are if you have children are everybody's children and 
And it does sometimes, a, a bugbear of mine is when you hear fathers talking about babysitting their children because their, their wives are going to do a work or going to a conference. They're not babysitting, they're minding their children. But I do think there's things there that we need to realize that by making things more flexible, by making things better, we are helping everybody there. And it is not, and should not just be, this is to help women because that makes us feel, make women feel sometimes that um, special concessions need to be made for them to do well in the workforce. And that is not the case. We are just as able to achieve as others, but those special concessions help every single person in that workplace, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, just to, to finish off before we move over to the to the Q&A, um, at our very first um, panel discussion in this series, uh, we had Dr. Nora Patton with us um, and we asked her to um, give us a question uh, that we might then ask all of our other panellists in the rest of the series. Um, so the question that she gave us was, what is your vision uh, for 2030? Um, and, and what are you doing to make that happen? Um, so, so maybe we've only just got maybe two or three minutes left before we move over to questions and answers. So even just a, a 30 seconds each, maybe if I come to Peter, if I come to you first, what's your vision for 2030? Look, I think under the National Broadband Plan, it's clear, um, and that's what we're aiming for. Um, you know, we want, we want to deliver a limitless Ireland, and what does that mean? It's really about bringing um, high-speed broadband to everybody in the country so that everybody has equal opportunity. Um, and that goes for men and women. And I think what Eva said really resonates. It, it's about finding balance. And if we get the right balance, you know, we shouldn't have to differentiate between uh, men and women for roles. Because if the balance is right, I agree, you know, both men and women can succeed at, 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 their, at their chosen careers. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we'll all look forward to that. Um, Mar Marguerite, if I come to you next, what, what's your vision for 2030? Yeah, so there's two, I suppose, the, the first thing, given what we've been talking about, is certainly a big increase in um, female students choosing engineering as a career. I think that would be great from all sorts of points of view, including the, the innovations, because they do need to take into account um, that diversity. It's only going to benefit from it. And the second thing is that we'd make a huge amount of um, progress and actually exceed our 2030 emission targets. Uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, make huge progress on, on our climate action plan and move on to the next stage as a country and, and indeed in, in Europe and internationally as well. Fantastic, I, th I think we can all get behind that. Um, Margie, if I, if I come to you next, what's your, what's your vision? Um, there, there's slightly two, Jennifer, sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> my, my first one is, it's more, uh, I suppose, look, that we have actually achieved our ambitions in terms of climate action by 2030. I feel really strongly about that. That's my kind of environmental hat here. But I suppose why it ties in here is there is so much evidence out there. We really don't need to kind of push to it anymore that solutions are at their best when they are driven by the 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 society that they represent and, and women need to play a part and, and they've been shown to the difference that they can make in terms of mitigating the risks due to climate action. So I'll get off my soapbox on that one and say personally uh, what I would love um, is to see the actions that we're considering as the uh, advisory group to the Department of Education at the moment on gender balance in early years to post-primary. Those actions put in play and, and for us to have seen effective results. Seven years is a, is a you know, sorry, not seven years, whatever. It, it, it's a, a nice bit of time for us to actually be able to see results and achievements if we can put those actions in play as soon as possible. Fantastic. And finally, if we, if we come to you, what's, what's your vision? Sure. So I suppose twofold, one would be to continue on with the significant progress we've made in terms of the student cohort and get to that 50-50 level. Um, and I don't think that that's impossible and will definitely happen within the next uh, 10 years. Um, but much more difficult and maybe harder to achieve in the next 10 years is to get to that balance of having 50-50 uh, in our faculty um, of male-female, which we are very, very far from in engineering and, and somewhat in architecture as well, but mainly in engineering. Um, and to have fe senior female faculty um, in engineering across all our universities. Super, Th thanks so much. Um, so, so at this point, I think we'll take some time for, for some questions and answers. Um, and I think I'll hand over to Andrea at this point. 
Thanks, Jennifer. And, and thank you to the panel. As you may not have seen, but the chat's been super, super busy. So I've started to pick some questions out and I've been uh, scribbling away. So I may come to you first, Steve, for uh, Gavin. It's not like him. He had a great question. You must have had three Weetabix this morning. <laughs> uh, but Gavin had a great question there around, do you think it's time to look at maybe a, a different third level offer? Something like what Stripe have just done at UL around that sort of immersive software engineering, because they're just going to go straight to source and try and sort out their talent pipeline. Is that yeah, something it, that you think has merit in, the, in an engineering sphere? So this is a more industry driven type of um, academic program. I think it has merit and, and it's, it's a, got a place within academia and within producing our engineers. And we are building closer relationships all the time with engineering companies through strategic partnerships um, and talking to them more. But I think you need to also be very careful that we're not producing engineers specifically for one industry. And when I get approached by industries, the first thing that they want to talk to you about is talent acquisition and can they get in there before their, their competitors. So we are producing engineers for industry. It's very important that we do that, but we also, if we're going to be producing the innovators or the new uh, business people of the future who create new businesses, et cetera, we need to make sure that we're not just streaming them for particular industries. And um, I don't know if that answers Gavin's question. No, that, that's super. I'd actually like to maybe move to Margie now and talk about mm. transferable skills. You, you spoke about that. And I know when we did our prep call, I can't remember who it was, a given great examples of some really high profile folks at the moment who you actually wouldn't know they well, then it's not known that they come from an engineering background and they have these obviously great problem solving skills. Um, I think the examples were, um, was it the CEO of the HSE? Uh, I can't remember who gave the examples on the call and we were chatting about that. And I know you touched on transferable skills in that. Can you maybe talk a little bit around what the focus on that's going to be as we drive forward? Especially sure. as we come out of COVID, I thought, think that could be a real interesting opportunity to widen yeah. the agenda. I, I, um, I think if you go anyway to the Forbes listing of the top CEOs in the world, you'll see you can tick the engineers through the list. It's actually um, uncanny how engineers move <laughs> around industries and, and, and places. Um, I mean, I, when I was in Engineers Ireland was at the height of the economic recession and I had that kind of first hand experience of trying to guide engineers who had, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of experience working in their specific discipline, guiding them to the fact that 99, maybe 90 percent of what you have is completely transferable to another discipline in engineering or, or outside of engineering. And every job has technical knowledge, right? So, so every job you do need to have technical depth. Um, but that technical depth is probably the only hurdle. But, but I, I feel um, we, we get quite blinkered by our career to date and, and we only see the technical piece. And we, it takes a lot for people to take a step away and go, actually, I've got leadership skills here. I've I've got critical thinking. I've got all of that. And um, I suppose in terms of kind of transferable skills today, I think that's a real message that we need to get across. And to be fair to Engineers Ireland again, um, I think they've done an awful lot in terms of gearing engineers towards continuing professional development and not just doing the training, but actually reflecting on it. Because I, I think that it's that piece that makes people open their heads to actually I can do this job and when it comes to gender balance it goes back to what Aoife was saying when you do that reflective piece women traditionally when they see a job spec that they don't tick all the boxes will seriously question whether they put their name forward by comparison with men and it's a general statement but the, the evidence is behind it men will see I, I tick two-thirds of the boxes well I'm in for a, a winner here um, and I, I think that that idea of transferable skills is very important here because you have to be able to only tick two-thirds of the boxes to, to actually be a good candidate and the people who are hiring value that they will actually appreciate the fact that well you're actually bringing something different to the table and I think that's an important thing for in particular women in engineering to, to think about. 
Thanks, Margie. I'd love to come to Marguerite and Peter now with a view to maybe focusing on the industry side of the house. And I was really interested what Eve was saying before around the abandon rates across the course. And then obviously you're seeing very early abandon rates then uh, as, as engineers are going into careers. And we would term that the leaky pipeline. Um, and um, from a WITS perspective, this is our focus for the next five years as part of our strategic vision is to tr really try and understand what's going on in the leaky pipeline and really driving to policy and interventions based on evidence around retention of women across STEM careers. So it's something that we hold uh, near and dear. And I know Engineers Island are doing some great work in this space too. So when you think about the leaky pipeline and given the fabulous careers that you both have, I mean, what are some of the things that come to mind immediately that we have to start to get serious about? So I, I think one of the things Peter has referred to already, um, and it was in um, with respect to maybe our learning through COVID, but you know, not having that flexibility in the past was a big issue on your daily on a daily basis. And I think that our eyes have been open to that, and that's going to make a big difference. And hopefully, we won't go backwards. I think there's another side to that though, which is very significant, particularly for engineers, which is geographic flexibility. So very often, particularly early in your careers and even going into mid career, there's a big um, sort of uh, travel requirement on engineers to do particular roles in particular places and that you're quite tied down geographically. Uh, it certainly was an issue within the ESB. We're expected to get experience around the country. I worked in every uh, town and city on the West Coast at different times um, and that is quite disruptive in terms of a, a lifestyle. So I think there is something about geographic flexibility as well. But um, between, um, you know, the technology improvements and that understanding of flexibility now, I think that's going to make a big difference, hopefully, for the future. And just one other small point, it mightn't all be negative. So just going back to what Margie said there about those transferable skills, sometimes people leave because engineering gives you such a broad base and, you know, that logical reasoning that is in demand in other places that actually it mightn't be negative. It might just mean we need to get more in so we can spread them more widely. Um, so it, it, it might not be a negative leaky point pipe in all cases. Thanks, Marguerite. Peter, what are your thoughts on that when we talk about the leaky pipeline? Yeah, it, it's very interesting. When I was listening to Aoife earlier, um, I started a telecoms business in the early 2000s and um, I became an external examiner in Kevin Street, not, not for my desire to go back to college, but more so and um, to, 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 I suppose, bring graduates into our business. And um, I, I was certainly in there with the mindset of finding the best and bringing them uh, into, uh, as graduates into the business and then growing them in the business and then, you know, finding where they, where they go, whether it's engineering or into sales or management. But uh, what, what I found most interesting in that, in that, um, in, in the engagement with Kevin Street was I, at the end of the year, I would interview the students. And it was very interesting to hear from the students, there's no jobs available. Right. They felt there was no jobs or opportunities. And I put advertisements up and I had to put them up inside, inside the college without going after individuals. But it, it, what amazed me was the lack of people applying for the roles. And I think, what, so in the first year I started that, and the second year I went back to the course coordinator and, and um, the dean of the college at the time. And I said, okay, I think you actually have to start ma making the students understand what their opportunities are because it's the fear and, and, and when I think about going on and finishing my degree, there was only about 33 people finished a degree and one female out of the whole group. And it's the fear of, of, of not knowing or, or the expectation of them when they come out of college. Am I going to be able to meet the demand of that business? And it's no different when you look at um, a job specification. And um, to Margie's point, when you, when you look at it, it's, it's, you have to be excelling at everything. And it's impossible to excel at everything, but it's the small things that matter, you know, are you involved in team sports? What is your extracurricular activities that show a different side? You don't have to be scoring one ones or two ones, or you don't have to be top of the class because you can bring so much more to an organization than necessarily you being the best in your class from an engineering perspective. I think the education around that, and also, and I know Eva's saying you, you don't want to be specific to one industry, but I think you know one of the things that I brought in Kevin Street was we, we put a Cisco module training in, into the electronics industry but it was a supplement to the actual course so they could do it outside of normal classes and get a certification and it meant that they had an understanding or the, the the students had an understanding of this is what it would mean practically to work in this area and I think you could do that in every area and, and maybe 
uh, as a, you know, we, we, we had projects as well. When I was in college, we had projects as well as your standard classes. Maybe you just make a project module. Uh, and, and it could be, it could be an, uh, you know, after classes project module in different areas of expertise, give people a sense of what does it mean to work in, in that industry and how, how could your career progress? It's to take away the fear. Um, and I was the same, honestly, when, when I finished college, I did a diploma and I went back at night time. And the reason why I didn't continue on to do my degree full time was because I went to, I went on a J1 to the US and I started working um, for a, a retail liquidation company. And I loved being in business, the business aspect of things and the sales aspect of things. And I just saw engineering as a, as, as a scary thing. But when I came back to Ireland, I couldn't get a business visa at the time in the US. I came back to Ireland and I said, okay, I've spent three years of this. I better commit to it. And I did my degree at night time and I got involved in, in uh, automation engineering. And then, and then the barriers, the, the, the fear started to lift. And I saw how I could progress to where I wanted to get. And, and, and those things are, it's not readily visible, I think, for a lot of students going through college. And hence, they drop out and they go into something else, you know, and, and you know, it's a long time before they realize actually, where am I going to land on my career path? So, so helping clear those barriers and that fear um, would, I think, be the best approach. I think a lovely segue into um, the last sort of question and comment we have, and thanks Magella and Marion for bringing this one up, is around apprenticeships. And um, so when we spent International Women's Day on Monday meeting with Minister Simon Harris, and I could think of no better way for us to spend our time than that. And in that he was sharing with us the apprenticeship action plan, which is going to have some real heavy gender pieces in there, which we're really super excited about. But I know uh, Marguerite, ESB have always done incredibly well in apprenticeships. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more around that, because we see that maybe as one pathway, a mature apprenticeship or expanding that apprenticeship model where we could actually attract more women in STEM. And they're seeing then hands on what that engineering actually looks like. Yeah, and you know, however hard you think it is to attract um, females into professional engineering, it's a whole other ball of wax to try and get females into areas like we have, which are effectively in the outside world training as electricians and fitters uh, and even uh, line workers. So th that is a real challenge. Um, so our network technicians, uh, we have 1% uh, female um, population at the moment. So even the difficulty with that is when, when they're so rare, it's difficult to actually even attract females in and retain them because they become an only and the only female in a particular location. So there was some significant work done in that area and, and some of it has been mentioned already. So Eva mentioned the ads. So ads are really, really important. The other thing um, that we found was that the screening processes, so before you get to interview, and um, they were effectively set up for donkey's years because there was only male applicants and they, they kind of were set up around male mentality. And we found that there was a disproportionate amount of females were being screened out before you ever got to interview because that was set up in a particular way for the last 40 or 50 years. And actually by changing that a little bit and just making sure that more uh, female applicants appeared at interview and uh, just by tweaking that a little bit meant that we actually got in far more female applicants. So we've ended up for the last two years, we've had about 12 out of 72, so a much greater proportion than we had in the past. And having more than one and certainly having 12 gives them a little network and a group and it means you're much more likely to uh, retain them. But equally that, um, you know, they, they in turn then going back out to schools and talking to uh, female students has had a huge impact in terms of the number of applications we've got because people can see it and touch it and, and they realize that this is a career choice and they can see role models and people they can identify with, you know, not people in their 40s and 50s, but people who are maybe somewhere only five years older than them and they can really identify with it. So it's all those different factors and we're going to have to continue to work on it but we really need apprentices and it is another career choice not everybody has to go through university I suppose so it's it's one worth pursuing. Anything from you Peter on that around apprenticeships or? One of the challenges I suppose at the moment um, with COVID is actually getting people to work side by side with one another and um, and look, apprenticeships are, apprenticeships are vital, and, and as a telecoms industry, uh, we've supported it, and, and um, we do have an apprenticeship program in telecoms, and a lot of it's driven by the retail, sorry, by the, by the operators, both wholesale and retail commercial operators, and also the uh, all of the construction companies involved in building the telecoms networks. 
Um, and it, but, but part of the challenge is right now with apprenticeships is getting people in and, and training them in the job uh, has been has been challenging. Um, but it is certainly the way to bring people whether whether you've gone through college, putting them out involved, getting them involved. The ground the ground roots or the grassroots of the industry is critical and um, for both for both um, male and female um, graduates or, or or young students, absolutely critical. I'm conscious of the time. I'm sure we, we could actually keep talking for, for, for hours on the subject. So um, before I make thanks, I just wanted to say I was really excited about this panel um, for a couple of reasons. But I think this is one way that we can showcase when you have the right people in the room who, who are coming from these very different perspectives and can drive this conversation. You can actually see where these perspectives perspectives collide and where we can I think we have a genuine opportunity to take the conversation forward and I think this panel today has really showcased that from sort of our ac academic and industry point of view that you know you're you got you're all on the same page and it's now about sort of really coming together to see if we can make a big lift to advance some of this and I'm really excited about some of the opportunities that we're going to be talking about over the coming months, working with the department and working with uh, other partners like Engineer, Engineering Ireland to try and move this forward. So I think it's been a really great showcase to show that joined up thinking and, and the opportunity that's just, just a little bit ahead that we could maybe start to drive. So thank you so much for your time today. I'd like to thank Dublin Tech Talk, the lovely gal for his sponsorship. Um, the fabulous Jennifer for um, obviously supporting the panel in the questions and uh, it was super. Thank you so much. Jennifer is a new member of the board and so we just threw her in the deep end and she did wonderfully well today. And to Margie and Aoife, Peter and Marguerite for your time, for your generosity, but also I think for your thought leadership. I'm really, really excited about where this could go in the coming months uh, and I really look forward to sort of carrying on the discussion. So thank you, everyone. I uh, hope you, uh, the, all the audience enjoyed the panel as much as we did. And we'll see you not next week, the week after for week four of our leadership series, which is around cybersecurity. So we'll see you all then. Thank you so much. Okay.